and welcome back. I thought I might start our first sort of series of recorded lectures by going over the basics of computer science and laying the foundation. We're going to follow our text in large measure, but also the videos that are complementary videos to it. And I thought I might give a, a different and hopefully not overly long perspective on that. So let's start off. There's a series of things that I want to talk about to lay the groundwork for computer science and what exactly that is and what science itself is, right? What is science? Um, it turns out that the most central and consistent definition of science that we might have is that science is about making predictions. Now, how would a prediction that you make in a scientific framework be different from the kind of prediction that you might make in, say, an astrological framework that you might have. If you open up a newspaper or the digital equivalent of such nowadays, um, one of the things that you'll find is they'll usually have some kind of horoscope. And so if you read the horoscopes, they tend to be kind of um, general predictions of what's going to happen. They say things like you're going to have a good day or you're going to have a bad day. But there's nothing that you can really test in that prediction, not in a substantial, consistent, systematic way at least. Science is different from that. Science is about making predictions as well. That's really the only task of science. Um, the other concomitant um, benefits that come from that, uh, things like understanding the universe and, and finding some essential truths about nature, those are all sort of side effects. The central aspect of science, basic fundamental science I'm talking about, um, is to make precise, quantitative, and most importantly, falsifiable predictions. That's the most important aspect of this. So what you'll do is you'll see a different kind of prediction that's made from a scientific framework than the astrological framework. So rather than saying, oh, you're going to have a bad day, in science, they'll make a precise and quantifiable and falsifiable prediction. So what they'll say is that you'll step outside your house at 8.37 a.m. and you'll be struck by a meteor and die. Um, obviously, these aren't the really the kinds of predictions that we make. They're not usually so dire. They're much more prosaic, and they're usually quantitative. But it brings across the idea of falsifiability rather strongly. What you can do is you can maybe peek your head out or maybe stick a stick out your door at 8.37 a.m. And if a meteor comes blazing past and cuts that stick in two, you'll be like, oh, holy cow, I think they were onto something. Or if the, you stick the, you put the stick out and nothing happens, you're like, aha, I have falsified that prediction. And so therefore, there is something wrong with the framework that was used to make that prediction. Often that framework, uh, that systematic approach or that framework that we employ is a mathematical framework. That's the model, the mathematical model that we employ. And so in science, we use a feedback loop where we make a precise quantitative and falsifiable prediction using that mathematical framework that we have. And if that prediction is falsified, we go back and tweak and adjust our framework until the predictions that it makes, the predictions that it computes, the values that it calculates, those are more and more accurate. And eventually we end up with a systematic framework or a mathematical model like quantum mechanics, for example, which is the most successful scientific theory in the entire history of the human species. Not a single prediction that it has made in its 80 plus years has been falsified. And it's incredibly precise down to billions and trillions of, um, of significant digits, right? So really strong and very precise and accurate theory that we've developed. And that's the process of science in general. The process of science is to come up with a framework like that. And there's a, a way to distinguish it from what you see 
um, that's rather interesting and unique, um, the, the way that we see the scientific framework as opposed to, say, um, a, an astrological framework. There's something called the Barnum effect that often comes to play, and there's a, a former magician turned um, incredibly uh, insightful skeptic called um, the Great Randy. It's actually His name's actually James Randy. There's a very lovely... Um, documentary out about him. I think it's on Netflix and you can pick it up. It's called An Honest Liar and I'd highly recommend giving it a go. It's um it's a very it's a very nice documentary on on what James Randi has been able to accomplish. But basically this is the idea that if you have some kind of a generic description of things like personality, a lot of people think it applies to them. And it's not really as falsifiable as you might think. And one of the experiments that James Randi did is that he went to the psychology class and he said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I have found this incredible astrologer who will do a detailed uh, horoscope and astrological chart of you. But he needs incredible amounts of detail about your life up to this point in order to make this customized chart for you. Right, so he'll, he'll he came up with this um, series of questionnaires which detail everything about where you were born, what time were you born, what clothes were your parents wearing. I'm making some of this stuff up, but lots of details about your life up to that point. So all these thirty students in this class filled it out in detail and hand it back, and he compiles them, takes them in these manila envelopes, and says, "Okay, great, you guys did a good job. I'm going to take this, and it's going to take about two months." for our great astrologer to make um, a personalized horoscope about you. And sure enough, two months later, he shows up back in that same class, again with manila envelopes, but this time the manila envelopes contain the personalized, customized horoscopes for each individual student in that class. And they've got their names on them, so he reads the names, goes and hands it out to each one and says, okay, now I want you to tear open the sealed envelope and start to read that prediction that you have. And then after they've digested it over about 20 minutes, he says, okay, now I want you to raise your hand if you think that this describes you perfectly. And every single hand went up. Amazing, right? And so he says, okay, now we're going to do a little experiment. You're going to put the prediction back in the manila envelope, which they did, and you're going to raise that up high above your head and then you're going to pass it to the person behind you. And I want you to now open up the manila, manila envelope you were handed by your neighbor, read that horoscope, and raise your hand if it fits you. Every single hand went up once again. And the reason is the predictions they make are things like, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you have not turned to your advantage. Disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. Does this apply to you? And most of these turns out general, generic statements people can find some form of identity with and say, oh yeah, that kind of applies to me. It's a subjective, it's a subjective, qualitative a uh, prediction that it makes that's different from you're going to step outside your door at 8:37 a.m. and get beamed by a meteor that's going to kill you right that's immediately falsifiable there's no ambiguity in interpreting it you're either going to get that meteor there or you're not and that'll tell you whether the framework that you're using to generate those predictions is a good framework or does it need fixing and so this is the general approach that we've employed in things like physics. Physics is about making predictions about motion, how the universe does things, right? Um, the, the Greeks were some of our first natural philosophers, and uh, they loved knowledge, and that's where the, the name, the term for physics comes from. It's their word for nature. And for the about 2,000 years or so, Aristotle dominated the ideas of physics and of motion and his central tenet was that motion here on earth is different than motion in the heavens 
And that kind of makes sense when you observe what's going on around you, right? You look up and you see um, the moon um, and the stars and the other planets, and they're constantly in motion. The moon's always circling. Um, the sun seems to circle us, right? Orbit us, uh, you might say. Uh, of course, that's a change with um, the heliocentric theory. And on Earth, it's different. Motion's different. Things don't tend to stay in motion. If I take a ball or a marker and I roll it on the ground, um, you know, with, with, a, with a sort of like a, a small push or a medium level push, by the time it gets about 20 feet, it stops. So it seems that the natural state of motion is different in the heavens than it is on Earth. On Earth, you put objects in motion, they seem to stop. In the heavens, you have objects in motion and they seem to never stop. They keep going forever. So these must be different kinds of motion. So this is sort of what dominated um, our, our, our thought process about motion for a while until Galileo came along. And Galileo was sort of the first um, scientist in the modern sense. He was an empiricist. He used experiments and he made predictions. And he said, let me test this out. Is this really what happens? And he started to mess with the inclined plane and he started to look at how things fall. And, you know, um, Aristotle thought that heavier things must fall differently than lighter things. And a ex simple experiment that you can do is you can take a sheet of paper and then when you drop it, you notice that it sort of floats around and falls slowly. But if you take that same sheet of paper and you ball it up, and then drop it, it drops faster, drops straight down. Now its mass didn't change, its weight didn't change, but its aerodynamics changed. And so its rate of fall, apparent rate of fall changed. And eventually Galileo realized that when you get rid of the air friction and friction in general, that the rate of fall for all objects is the same. And uh, Newton eventually overturned that even more. And he realized that the same theory of gravitation, the same forces that apply in the heavens that keep these planets and these, um, these, uh, these uh, astronomical objects in motion, that's the same force that's applying here on Earth. That force of gravity is identical. And then you start to think about atoms and all this stuff. All of this comes through the same kind of process that we've employed in science. All of the progress that we've made in science uses the same approach where we make, we use some kind of framework, some kind of systematic method. Normally that's a mathematical method because the kinds of predictions that we want to make are these precise and quantitative numerical predictions, right? That we can falsify. So we use some framework to make these quantitative predictions. We test the prediction, we do some experiment, and if it works, we don't say, oh great, this framework is absolute truth. We keep testing it, and we keep testing it in novel circumstances and see what the limits of its prediction are. And when we find some context or some problem domain where it makes a prediction that's falsified, we go back and adjust our method our methodology, our systematic approach. And so since we're making these quantitative predictions, that systematic approach is often mathematical in nature. It turns out math tends to describe nature in a very intimate way. As we start to talk about that, I'll talk about that in, in, in just a minute. But I want to step back just a bit and say that as we started to discover more things about the universe, we started to discover the particulate nature of it. Um, way back when, more than I think 2,500 years ago, people like Democritus started to think about things and said, hey, how small do things get? I know I can take this uh, maybe a, a, a log or a, or, a, or a stone of some sort and I can chop it in half, then I can chop it in half again, and I can chop it in half again. And they said, how long can I keep this process up? Is this an infinite process? Or is there, if, will I eventually get to some small aspect of it that I cannot chop up any further. That's unsliceable. The Greek word for slicing is tomos. So unsliceable was atomos, atom, right? And so Democritus theorized there must be some atom, some small, essential, unsliceable, unbreakable, minimal quantum of this thing that's a, that, that, that we're looking at that can't be sliced any further. 
And so over the years, as we started uh, after Galileo, as we started to do more and more empirical science, we started to discover what we thought were these particles that couldn't be sliced any further. And we came out, we called them atoms. And then we realized those things that we called atoms, which we thought were unsliceable or unbreakable, we actually could slice them. And so we discovered subatomic particles, right? Um, the name, unfortunately, stuck by that time because we'd already started to call them atoms. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's not what Democritus thought of because we could slice it. And then we discovered um, electrons and protons and neutrons. Then we realized we could slice those protons and neutrons even further and we could get quarks. And so then we started to develop the standard model of particle physics, which builds upon quantum mechanics, the most successful theory of, uh, that humans have developed, as I mentioned uh, previously. And in the standard mo model, you have um, leptons, quarks, and intermediate gauge bosons, right? These are the three kinds of things that you have. And then it turns out now we can look at it and we can start to, instead of thinking about these particles that are there, we can think of them in terms of fields that permeate all of uh, space-time. And these quantum fields exist for each kind of particle. So if you, if you look at a quark, an up quark has an up quark field. Um, uh, you know, and if you look at um, electrons, there's an electron field electron quantum field that permeates it so we uh, that permeates uh, the whole universe all of space time so now we start to think of things in terms of quantum field theory and it turns out that even this is probably not fundamental now we've started to look at the information content of the universe and information is one of those things that falls under the rubric of computer science which we'll talk about and, and so it, certainly it's in the book as well but we'll talk about it as well that's classical informational theory there's also quantum informational theory where we start to talk not about black holes uh, from a particulate um, perspective but from the information content of um, black holes, and we talk about violating relativity because by information transmission, not necessarily just um, whether you're going to violate it uh, physically or not. And we start to talk about the holographic nature of the universe as well. So all of these things, it turns out, seems to indicate that the universe at its core is informational and that the physical elements just carry out that process of computation. There's a very famous physicist, um, Steven Weinberg, who has a way with words. And so he's famous for having said in, in describing general relativity that space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to bend. This is when we first realized that there is no force of gravity, that it's, a, it's these perturbations in space-time itself, or the fabric of space-time. Um, that uh, that manifests as what we see as gravity. So in the same way, when he started to look at this idea of the informational aspect of the universe and the informational aspect, uh, the fundamental uh, part of the aspect of that is the bit that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, he said, he's famous for having said, from it, from bit, it. Uh, and so it's sort of like uh, uh, talking about the most fundamental aspect of the universe being informational. And this, as I said, falls under the domain of computer science. Computer science is in fact about exactly these kinds of processes that transform information. So as you start to embark upon your career in computer science, you can think in a very real sense of computer science as being about the processes that transform data into knowledge or transform information in some way and computer information systems as being more about the flow of data and the curation of that data and the management of that data and the underlying systems that um, actually transform that data. So that flow of data is a part of the processes that you have and it turns out the universe itself tends to convert data into information using some process. That process can be the particles, the things that we call the leptons or the quarks or the intermediate um, gauge bosons, or it can be some abstract mathematical function, um, the values of which we can compute by some step-by-step -step process that we call an algorithm. 
So that step-by-step -step process allows us to compute or calculate the values of some function. And so the way that I might sort of think about it is if I were to place it, is that um, computer science is a proper subset of math and that physics is a proper subset of computer science. The reason I say that is because math, uh, uh, physics deals only with computable functions. Math deals with all kinds of things. Uh, mathematics, there are functions in math which we don't know if we can solve, and there are functions in math which we can immediately apply to the world around us. And so anytime we can solve a mathematical function and apply it to the world around us, that's a computable function. That's a function we can compute, and it seems to give us some insight into the nature uh, of existence and our world around us. But there are a lot of functions in math that we have no idea if they're applicable to the, to the universe as a whole. So for or our physical world or our physical reality. For example, in the um, early 19th century, a couple of mathematicians sat around and said, OK, we've seen Euclid's geometry and it deals with planar surfaces and the world around us isn't flat and plain like that. It's curved. We live on a curved world. Um, locally, it seems flat. But globally, it's this oblate spheroid. It's like a sphere that someone's sitting on on the top of, right? And so they said, gee, I wonder what geometry would look like on this kind of curved surface. And they worked it all out, and people were like, cool, nice job. I got no use for it. And it sat around, right? For decades, it just sat around until this um, young uh, dude working at a Swiss patent office um, started to think about it. He started to think about the ideas of physics around him. And he developed this theory, which uh, eventually became the theory of special relativity. This guy that we're talking about is Einstein, of course. And Einstein had a particularly interesting history. Um, you know, he, he, he spoke um, a little slowly sometimes as a kid because he was thinking about stuff. And so his teachers thought maybe he's not the smartest kid. He was pretty good in um, physics and sciences. Uh, he was really good in probably the sciences, but he was kind of good in some of the math, but not really a stellar mathematician. He was very poor in some of the other areas as well. So as he went to university, he studied physics, um, but his personality was also a little weird and people didn't get along with him or some of his professors didn't get along with him because he'd contradict them. And so when he graduated, the way that the system worked back then is that your professors had to recommend you for an, a professorial position. None of them did that. So he'd gotten married to his um, high school sweetheart and um, they'd already had a child that they'd given away. And so now they were going to have another kid and he didn't have a job. He didn't know what to do. He just graduated university. So a friend of his hooked him up with a job in Switzerland working at the patent office. And because he was a pretty smart dude, he'd get done with his patent duties Oh, probably halfway through the day and the rest of the day he'd have free. So he started to think about these mathematical problems and in the year 1905, when I think he was like 26, it was his magical year, he published a series of papers, including the one on special relativity, on Brownian motion, on the photoelectric effect, which eventually garnered him the Nobel Prize. And, uh, you know, although he published it, it didn't get noticed for a little while. It took Max Planck to really notice him and say, hey, wait a minute, this kid's on to something very interesting. Um, when he's talking about photons and stuff and how there's this quantum nature to light and how it packaged, how energy is packaged um, in the universe. So uh, eventually he got noticed and then he got massive recognition. And then he said, okay, I can continue this theory of special relativity, um, which look at how objects uh, behave when they move really fast. And he realized that there might be a connection to gravity, what looked like the force of gravity with that oddly enough. But it required him to start to think about space and time together as space-time, and then the idea that space-time would curve and bend, and that would create the effect of gravity. Now that required a lot of math, which he was not that good at, so he contacted one of his former professors, Minkowski, who he had a working relationship uh, at this point, thank goodness, and they started to work on this together, and they realized that these mathematicians in the you know mid part, early part of the 19th century, 
had already worked out what these surfaces would look like. So this math that was developed in a very abstract context, which seemed to have absolutely no application to anything at all, suddenly became applicable to the physical world that we know. And that mathematical function became physics, right? So people started to wonder, are all mathematical functions computable and applicable to the world around us? And just we haven't figured it out at this point. So they, these mathematicians started to study which functions were computable, the ones that we could calculate values for. And so people like Alan Turing started to look at the limits of computation and so invented the field of computer science. And so what I would say is that computer science sits at the intersection between math and physics. Math has a lot of stuff in it that we don't know if it's solvable, um, we can't wrap our heads around, but some of those functions might be computable. And computer science helps us figure out which functions are computable. That's one of the central aspects of what it does. And we'll talk about this idea of um, Turing machines, what Alan Turing came up with, and Alonzo Church, and John von Neumann, and all these people came up with. You'll see it in the book. You'll see it in the complimentary videos as well. We're going to see exactly how some of these things tie together. But that's the context that I'd place it in. So I'd say that um, math and physics and computer science, well, certainly physics and computer science, any kind of science, is really about making predictions using some sort of systematic, structured methodology. That's your model. The model's usually mathematical for some reason. The universe seems to speak the language of math. Um, we don't know why. Uh, there are papers that people, orders of magnitude smarter, me, smarter than me, have written talk, talking about the unreasonable power of mathematics, and uh, we don't know why it is. This is just how the universe seems to be. All we know is the predictions we make, like in quantum mechanics, this crazy mathematical theory that seems to imply things about the universe that makes no sense to our normal human way of interacting and dealing with and understanding the universe. This theory, quantum mechanics, makes predictions, none of which have ever been wrong. It's insane, right? Over 80 some odd years. And it's the basis for a lot of the technology we utilize as well. Um, why nature is that way? We can't tell you, that's not in the domain of science. Um, what does it mean? Is nature really like that? Is it both a wave and a particle at the same time? We can't tell you. We, don't, you, we, we can just tell you this is what the mathematical function predicts, and it implies there's a wave-like nature and a particle-like nature. Particle-like nature, you tend to visualize a billiard ball, but really it's a bunch of numbers associated with something. A wave, you tend to think of a water wave or a wiggly line. Really, it's a bunch of numbers associated with something and so all of these are just numbers that we've associated and we use those numbers to predict new numbers which we associated to with the world around us and if those predictions are correct we say hey bully for us the mathematical model that we have works so physics deals with these kinds of equations or functions like newtonian um, uh, uh, gravity the function for newtonian gravity right and some of these models that we have have been verified or validated to such an extent that it would be weird for us to deny that they must reflect some insight about the underlying objective reality, no matter how weird it seems. When in quantum mechanics it implies that everything has a wave and a particle nature, that there's this wave-particle duality, no matter how nutty it seems to us, the predictions are so accurate and have been validated and verified over so many years that we can't help but say that must reflect something about the nature reality and we're not understanding it because we model nature in a certain way as we um, go from as we grow up as we go from being babies who are the best natural scientists right babies employ the same method Right? A baby might crawl over and see some kind of very cool things in the wall and they lick their finger and stick their, stick it in that thing in the wall and they get a little shock and they say, aha, the prediction that that would have been fun has been falsified. And so I will not stick my finger into a, 
electric socket again. And so babies, it turns out, are incredibly good scientists. And if you are now here, congratulations. You were a very successful baby, baby and a very successful scientist. And this is exactly the process that we utilize. We utilize this framework or this methodology to make predictions. And uh, we tweak our framework as needed. And then eventually it implies something about the world around us. Uh, but that, what, what the exact implication is, is, is beyond our pay grade. We just make the predictions. That's what we do in fundamental science. So math and physics and um, science, uh, computer science, are intimately related. As I'd mentioned, and Raymond and Gauss are the mathematicians that I was alluding to before. We talked about Einstein a little bit. Turns out all of these functions are functions that we can calculate or compute. That's what we deal with in physics. All of physics deals with computable functions. That's what we call these functions that we can um, compute the answer to or calculate the answer to. And the way that you do it is you calculate it using a, a bunch of steps, right? And so you need something to go through and do that calculation. Whatever does that calculation, we call that the computing agent or the computer. Interestingly enough, in the um, 19th century and early part of the 20th century, when you use the word computer, people didn't think of digital machines. They didn't exist at the time. What they thought about were female mathematicians. They were called computers at the time because what they do is they'd compute the um, results or the answers to these functions, the values of these functions. They'd, do, they'd be incredibly adept at doing these very involved calculations. So even up to the Manhattan Project, for example, when we invented the um, the nuclear bomb, right? Um, the computers that they used, the cutting edge computers were the brilliant female mathematicians that would come in and calculate these very complex um, functions that they needed to calculate. But when you break it down, most of those calculations can be broken down to, oh, sure, uh, an involved and complex bunch of steps, but each individual step is kind of easy and simple. Right, so this guy Turing, Alan Turing, one of the greatest minds our species has generated, in the 30s and 40s started to think about the li the limits of calculation and is it possible to automatically calculate the values of some functions. He wasn't the only one thinking about a church and all. We're also thinking about it as you'll see when you read the text or look at the videos. And so he thought that each individual step is simple and easy to calculate with a pen and paper, right? So for example, things like add X to both sides, subtract 15 from both sides and things like that. And so Turing thought, could a mechanical machine carry out these calculations if it's so simple? And he started to think of a hypothetical machine, which we nowadays call the Turing machines, that would carry out these simple individual calculation steps. And he said all we need to do, he thought about it, is to give them a complete set of these instructions where each instruction is a simple, easy to do, step-by-step uh, -step calculation, right? And that complete set of instructions, that step-by-step -step series of instructions, is what we call an algorithm. That's the program. That's a that's a computational solution. The algorithm is what we deal with in computer science. Almost the, the definition of computer science can be thought of to be the study of algorithms in a very real sense. And so the machine that he imagined was a very simple machine. It just had a little head, a read-write head, and a read-write head. And it had this um, very narrow um, reel of tape, uh, like a paper, a very narrow reel of paper that it used. This used the latest model that was used in technology then, which was the ticker tape. And um, the uh, stock analysts and stockbrokers would use the telegraph system to get the latest equities values from Wall Street. So rather than having to be over there themselves, they could be in their offices removed from uh, the central trading floor. And they could have the values of the, of, the, of the stock equities communicated to them by this telegraph where what it would do is it would constantly just type that out. It would just print it out on this little thin um, reel of paper. And so it would say like value of AT&T, you know, $1 or whatever it might be at the time. Oh, traded 
500 shares and now the value is this and so just constantly printed out a series of values on these on these reels of tape and so since it would tick off that tape they started calling that tape ticker tape and whenever there was um, a parade of some sort, a celebratory parade of some sort in New York, all of these stockbrokers and stock analysts, etc., would take these reams and reams of ticker tape that were churned out of these ticker tape machines and throw them out the window to celebrate that. And that became the ticker tape parade that we have. And this was sort of the cutting edge technology at the time. There's a, there's a grand tradition in science of using uh, cutting edge technology to always represent um, some kind of um, scientific idea you're trying to communicate that's innovative. So for example, in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, telephones had come up and you had the switchboard, I guess in the latter part of 19th, early part of 20th, um, and you'd use these connections. You'd have an operator which would connect up these different lines. And so when they were trying to model the brain, they thought, ah, the brain must be like a telegraph operator, it's just connecting up these different circuits, these different neuronal circuits, right? So this is a grand tradition, and, and Turing continued that in, in a sense by imagining his um, hypothetical machine to be sort of the same kind of ticker tape, but just with an infinite amount of tape, an infinite um, sheet of paper with like little squares on it and a little read write head that could read the symbol that was on the square that could erase it and that could write a symbol on there and by just using this process he realized he could communicate the series of steps or instructions to solve any function that was computable his hypothetical machine could do that so this led very quickly to him thinking about well what kinds of problems could it solve and what could it not solve and it said if oh, and he started to think in these ways and he'd have these conversations with von neumann and others where they started to think about the idea well if physics deals only with computable functions and humans are physical beings can our brains be modeled by a computable function and if so can a machine calculate that computable function could a machine then think and they started to think about these ideas of thinking machines. And he's actually written a paper about it. And he talked about it with John von Neumann. And they were building upon the latest sort of neurobiological models and using that as inspiration. In fact, John von Neumann, when he started to propose the von Neumann architecture, uh, in which data and programs live together in the same memory space, he only credited a single paper in that. And that paper was a neurobiological paper. So these people were very brilliant mathematicians thinking about these ideas. And Turing started to think about, suppose machines can think, how will you, when would you conclude that the machine was as smart as a human being? That a machine was intelligent enough to pass for a human being? That a machine, this artificial machine, was actually intelligent? And so he thought about these parlor games that people would play in Victorian times. Um, in Victorian times, when, when people would get together uh, socially, they had this idea of separating the genders. And so people came up with these games to allow for the different um, genders to mix together and socialize. And so there was this game that he came up with called the imitation game. There's some, I guess, controversy on whether this is an actual game or not uh, that existed in the Victorian times. But his uh, general idea of it was this. He said, suppose that um, there's a man and a woman, right? So think Victorian times, and you send them behind a curtain, right? And now you can interact with the person that's behind there, one of them will go hide in another room and the other person will stay there. And you have to figure out with whom you're conversing. And the only way that you can converse with them is to write a note and slip it under the curtain and they take it and they write a response and slip it back under the curtain and you never get to see them. And you have to guess, am I conversing with the man or the woman? And so he thought, what if I change this scenario a little bit and I said, and I say I send a human being and a machine behind a curtain, machine that might profess to be able to think 
like a human being, right? And the only way to interact with that entity that's behind there, one of them goes into the back room and the other stays there. And the only way to interact with them, whether it's human or machine, is via a typewriter, right? That was the telegraph. That's the cutting edge technology at the time. Used it in um, ticker tapes, etc. as well. And you have to decide on the basis of typing out your questions to them, whoever they are behind it, the machine or the human, and they type their responses back. And you have to decide, am I conversing with the human or the machine? And if you cannot distinguish between the two, at that point, that machine will be said to be intelligent. That's the Turing test for artificial intelligence. Nowadays, we call that a soft test for uh, AI, artificial intelligence. We have digital machines that can pass that. We've got harder tests that we now employ. Um, but the digital machines back then were very new and bulky. Remember, there were these giant things that they had, right? Uh, they were these electronic digital machines that used vacuum tubes. And over the years, they started to use these electromechanical computers. And in fact, there's this very nice story about Admiral Grace Hopper, as you can sort of see there, where um, she was sort of the lead um, uh, scientist for the group. She wasn't an admiral at the time. Uh, she became an admiral subsequent, but she was the lead of the group. And as they were sending their program, their instructions through this giant machine, which is the size of a room, right? It suddenly stopped working. So because it was these electromagnetic mechanical computers and they used vacuum tubes and electromechanical circuits and relays and all that, they had to go and check every single one of these things. And, and as they started to look at all these relays in one of them, they found a moth that had flown into it and gotten fried and messed up the circuit. So they removed it and she being a good scientist said, okay, let's take that and put it in our journal. She taped it in the journal and said, discovered the first bug in a program. And it was an actual physical bug at the time. Now the term bug had been utilized prior to that and it was used subsequent to that, but it's a very good little, it's a fun little story that's there in the history of computer science. So these digital machines that people were using were the sizes of rooms, right? And they were probably no, definitely not as powerful as um, nowadays the computers or the computing agents or the computers that are even in doorknobs when you go and uh, check, uh, check in, for example, at a room. In fact, there's a funny story about that as these machines started to shrink, right? So these digital machines started to become smaller and started to become more powerful. And um, there's this gentleman that, um, worked at uh, Fairchild Semiconductor and had left to form his own company, Intel, Gordon Moore. And so they started to make these transistors and these integrated circuits. And he made an observation, it's sometimes called Moore's Law. It's not law, it's an observation. And he made this observation that um, it seems that every about 18 months or so, the amount of computing power on one of these circuits, uh, uh, these chips, doubles. And the cost to manufacture it drops in half. And he made this weird observation. He said, wow, this is very interesting to note. And he said, I don't see, I don't foresee any reason why this should slow down. And sure enough, for the next 30, 40, 50 years, this kind of trend continued. And now eventually we've reached the limit um, which um, Feynman had talked about. Richard Feynman's one of the most brilliant people our species has produced. Um, he, was, he was a physicist and he started to think about what the limits of computation might be. And so he gave this very interesting talk um, called uh, Plenty of Room at the Bottom in 1959. It predated Moore's observation actually. Uh, he was absolutely brilliant. He came up with an independent formulation of quantum mechanics, the path integral formulation for his PhD thesis. He de developed um, quantum electrodynamics. It was the first sort of quantum field theory that we had. Um, he was absolutely in love with his wife, Arlene, whom he knew um, since he was very young. And um, she unfortunately had a fatal disease and he still married her and, and it was also communicable. And so his family was warning him not to do it, but he did it anyway. And when she passed, he was heartbroken. And then he you know, went off on these crazy adventures. He's uh, quite a character. 
that you can sort of read about. Very fun to read about. He wrote about himself. He sort of um, propagated this myth about himself as well. There's quantum field theory that we're talking about. That's the most successful uh, theory that our species has ever um, come up with. And he sort of was one of the people that came up with one of the first theories of that. There were these um, other physicists that also came up with it. It turned out at the same time just about. Um, but anyway, he gave this talk in 1959 called Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he started to think about what would be the limits of computation. And he said, okay, if we just think about it, um, you're passing along these electrons in circuits. That's how you're, you're getting this electricity. Electricity is powering it. So if these circuits become small enough, these quantum effects, remember we talked about wave particle duality, come into play and an electron can tunnel or jump from one circuit to another. That's called the quantum tunneling effect. And when it does that, the circuit breaks down. It does a malcomputation. He said, that must be one of the limits that we'll use with it. And sure enough, the Moore's observation started to peter out when we started to um, get close to this uh, quantum limit. But he went further and he started to talk about how we could manipulate individual atoms. And he laid the foundation for the field of nanotechnology in a, in a very real way. So he made some very interesting um, observations about all this stuff. And nowadays, of course, that we're reaching the limit uh, of that, we're discovering other ways to bypass it. And we're, we're coming up with ways that we might be able to get past it. But the, this trend towards the miniaturization did continue for a while. There's a very funny little story associated with that. There was um, a computing conference that was held. I think it was the end of the 70s or so. And um, this uh, one of the speakers started to talk about this miniaturization, said one day computers will be everywhere. You know, the, this is, remember, when we're talking about most of the computers were the sizes of rooms, and this person's coming on saying crazy stuff like computers will be everywhere. And so someone in the audience said, uh, what are you going to do, put computers in doorknobs? And five years later, when they went to that same conference, um, they went to check in, and what they got was instead of a physical key, they got a card because sure enough, the doorknob had a little computer in it. And so we'll talk about the the sort of consequences of this kind of uh, massive computation and what the limits of what we can do are. There are a couple of videos that I'm going to post for you to watch, um, which talks about this idea of nanotech, nanotechnology, where we can manipulate individual um, atoms and individual components of the universe at that microscopic scale will change existence and what it means to be not just human, but what existence itself means for us from our human perspective. We'll get to this idea from self-assembly, where nature does all the computation. Imagine if I can pick out individual atoms and put them together, whatever kinds of atoms I need, I can take them out and put them together. Now imagine if I can program them so that they do it themselves. They follow a simple rule or a simple algorithm, which then instructs them to create these complex assemblies. Now normally you need an input of energy, but it turns out if you're dealing with things at the level of an atom, the ambient energy uh, from the environment might be sufficient to power that. So you don't need a separate energy source for that. And so if you can have this self-assembling um, system, imagine you can just tell this thing, hey, I want a car, it'll make a car. Hey, I want a hamburger, it'll make a hamburger. What does that mean? And what does that mean for us? What if I can take um, this, uh, um, this assemblage, this nanotech, and tell it to go in and not only get rid of cells that have cancer and target them specifically, but also change my genetic code and my genetic expression to change my physicality right now? Or what about if I can sit there and map every single atom and accounting for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you know, making allowances for that. What if I can program the location of every single atom, or maybe let's say molecule if I want to go, to, go up to that level in a computer, can I then recreate in my brain, let's say I can map every single atom or molecule in my brain, and then I can put that mapping in a computer. Can I then simulate myself within that? Which of me is real? Are they both real? What are the thoughts that we have? Who's intelligent? 
things like this will change um, what it means to be human and alive. Um, and all of these things are built upon functions that take information as input and output of prediction. This is what we test in fundamental science. And the, decision, the prediction that we make is some actionable decision, which we'll explore further in both the videos and in other places. But this is the central nature of computer science. We are a real science. We're well beyond just programming. Programming is one of the tools that we use. As that saying I have in the text, which is often misattributed, says, computer science is no more about programming than astronomy or astrophysics is about telescopes. Telescopes are a tool that we utilize in astronomy and astrophysics. We use the telemetry that we get and we observe it. And some astrophysicists and astronomers, of course, deal with telescopes and constructing them and the engineering of them and the mirrors. But in large measure, it's a tool that we utilize. In the same way, programming is a tool that we utilize in computer science. It is not the entirety of computer science. And this is what I hope that the early part of our journey will communicate to you because programming is a very powerful tool and we'll spend the second part of our journey sort of um, developing the skill of programming so that we can utilize it to full effect. It should be a fun and exciting journey and I'm glad to be making it with you. See you next time.